Hey, this is Pastor Allen. I just want to thank you for taking the time to download and watch this past week's message here at Central. God's doing some amazing things here, and we're praying that God will take His Word and plant it deep within your heart that you would become a greater Christ follower. We just want you to know that God it loves you and that God has a plan for you. But here's what we want you to understand. You need to be involved in a local church. So we don't want you to use this as a replacement, but we want to use this as a supplement to your faith. If you aren't connected to a local church, we would invite you to come here at Central at any of our locations and get plugged in. Remember, you are loved at Central. Have a great day. Our vision. Our vision. Our vision. Our vision. Our vision. Our vision. To be a multi-generational. 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 Multi-ethnic. Multi-ethnic. Multiplying church. That makes disciples. That makes disciples and raises up. Raises up the next generation. The next generation of, of church planners, missionaries, disciple makers, and church leaders that go out and reach Sanford, Sanford, to reach Sanford, to reach Sanford, and the, the surrounding communities, the surrounding communities, and the nations for Jesus Christ, nation for Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. Remember, your love is central. You, 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 you are loved at central. You're loved at central. You are loved at central. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11, just to get the blood going one more time, let's stand as we read God's Word. Now, I shared this a couple of weeks ago with our first service, but I want you to know the same statistic is true in the second. One out of every three people is good looking at Central. So look to your left, look to your right. If it's not them, it must be you. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the hands by flesh. Remember that you were at, at, the, at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were, you who once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by, de- by abolishing the law of commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through Him we have both access in one Spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the, with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also, being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You may be seated. All throughout history, uh, there have been walls that have been built. If you go back to ancient history and you have the, the walls of, of Nineveh, you have the walls that are in China, the great, uh, the great Wall of China. But even in our day and even in the recent history, we, we've had walls that have been built. And every culture uses walls to define itself within those walls. If you were to go around the world, you would see in South Africa that even to this day there are walls that separate the rich from the poor and the black from the white. In Northern Ireland, if you were to go and visit visit there, you would see that there are walls that separate Protestants from Catholics. If you go to Israel, particularly in Jerusalem or in the West Bank area, you'll see these great giant walls that separate Israelis from Palestinians. All throughout history, people have built physical barriers, physical walls, and typically the purpose for a wall is to keep the good people in and the bad people out. Yet, if we were to diagnose the the issue of our day, it's not so much that we built physical walls, but um, the majority of the walls that we have are not concrete or steel or barbed wire, but they're walls of hatred, bigotry, violence, murder, inequality, injustice, superiority, and control. Those are walls that are being built all around our world, all around our society, and all in our culture. And unfortunately, those walls of our culture have found them themselves in our church and in our churches. And the church in America has got its cues from the culture 
and has become even more influenced by the culture than the church is influencing the culture at large. And that is why that even to this day in America, the church is still one of the most ethnically segregated institutions in America. That's not God's vision. Do you realize that that's not God's heart? Jesus Christ died on the cross for all people. He created for himself a church which is to be made up of people of every nation, every tribe, and every language. God does not have a select few that fit a certain ethnic boundary. But yet he has created the church to be made up of people from all backgrounds. And therefore, in thinking of that, for us in our context, God does not have a city for a church. But God has a church for the city. God has uniquely placed our church for Sanford. He has placed our church for wherever community that you are living in. He has placed you to be there to be light and to be salt. So as we think through our vision, our vision is to be a multi-generational, multi-ethnic, multiplying church. And in thinking through what it means to be a multi-ethnic church, I want you to hear that our vision as a church is to be a church that reflects the diversity of our community. Our community is, is immensely diverse. And so we want to be a reflection of that. If you are not reaching your if you are not a reflection of your community, then you're not reaching your community. So we want to be a church that reflects the diversity of our community and proclaims the diversity of the kingdom of God. So Paul here is writing to believers in Ephesus. Ephesus is, I think, much like America in 2019. It is a rich metropolitan city. Ephesus and Central Florida, I think, are very similar because both the church that Paul's writing to and the city in which the church was, was ethnically diverse. People from all around came to the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was one of the major Roman cities. It was a major port town. It was a place where people from all different countries, all different places came to and did their trade. And so within that, within that diversity in the city came tension. Within that diversity came division. And scholars say that at this time in the Greco-Roman world, that, that there were racial tensions that ran deep all throughout the, the region. Scholars say that around the time that Paul is writing these very words to the Ephesians, that there were Jews and Syrians who were murdering each other in the streets in Caesarea. That is, you had Jews and Gentiles murdering each other in the street just for being a Jew or just for being a Gentile. And Paul writes to the Ephesians, after this event because he had just actually been in Caesarea after he writes to the church of Ephesus. So as Paul is writing this epistle, as he's writing this letter, as he's sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and what God has done, that's the context in chapter 2, is that we were once dead in our sins, but thank God Jesus Christ made us alive. For by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not a work so that no one can boast. Saved by God's grace. And within that understanding of being saved by God's grace, Paul then talks about the implications of the gospel. And what we see here is that multi-ethnicity is a part of what it means to, be under, uh, to understand the gospel, that there are multi-ethnic implications to the gospel. So Paul doesn't sweep around this issue. He deals with this issue head on. And so here's the, really the gist. If you were to take verses 11 through 22 and boil them down, here's what I think Paul would say to us this morning, that the gospel teaches us that the walls of hostility, those walls that divide us, have been destroyed by the work of Christ, paving the way forward for the church in the world. So let's unpack that. Number one, let's look at the walls of hostility. In verse 11, he says, remember, remember, remember that at one time in the past, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Here what Paul is doing is he is getting these, these Ephesian believers to remember what their old identity was. They saw themselves as being those who were Gentiles were Gentiles. Those who were Jewish saw themselves as Jewish. They were called by Jewish people the uncircumcised. Remember I told you a few weeks ago that when you call somebody uncircumcised in Jesus' day, that was smack talk. So here was a derogatory term. Isn't it amazing that, that you can take whatever situation in history and, and people still invent words to call other people in derogatory ways? And the reason that Paul says, go back to your old identity before, at one time, you were a Gentile and other people were Jews. That that is, these were your old identities. Now, what does it mean to have these as your old identities? That people in Paul's day found their significance, found their worth, 
found their pride, found their passion, and who they were. And so what they did is they said, well, you're this, we're that. We're insiders, you're outsiders. We're good, you're bad. And that was the division between Jew and Gentile. Now, Paul understood this division because he himself was a very proud Jew. He grew up hating Gentiles. There was a prayer that every Jewish man prayed every morning when he woke up. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not a Jew, I'm not a woman, and that I'm not a slave. That would be the prayer that Paul would have prayed before he knew Christ. He hated Gentiles. He especially, before he knew Christ, hated Gentile Christians. But yet, he understood now after Christ the deep complexities. See, because today we may not necessarily have the issue of Jew and Gentile, but we still have the issues of hatred. And Paul understood that the issue between a Jew and a Gentile was religious, it was cultural, it was racial, it was historical, it had deep roots. But here he says, remember, this is where you used to find your identity, your old identity. But now in verse number 12, he says, not only remember your old identity in the flesh, but remember your old identity before you knew Christ spiritually. He says, remember that you were at that time, when you were a Gentile, when you were a part of the uncircumcision, you were apart from Christ. You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant of promise. You had no hope and were without God in the world. Paul says that before Christ, you were separated, alienated, a stranger, had no hope without God in your life. And that is the case of everyone in the entire world who doesn't know Christ. It doesn't matter who you are, what your background is. If you do not know Christ, you're separated from God. And this separation from God leads inevitably to separation from other people. And the reason that we're separated from God is sin. Sin is what separates us from God, and sin is what separates us from other people. And you can trace it back to Adam and Eve in the garden. You remember when Adam and Eve sinned? What happened when Adam and Eve sinned? Well, God came, and God says, where are you, Adam? It wasn't that God didn't know where he was. Adam was hiding. He thought he was hiding from God. And Adam says, I'm here, God. And God says, what, did you, what have you done? What are you doing? And what, what, is, what is Adam's response in the garden? It's me. I'm an idiot. Is that in the Bible? No. What does he say? He says, God, that woman you gave me. You remember that's the woman that he said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, that he was in love with? Now he sinned, and what does he do? He separates himself from that woman. And what does the woman do? She blames the snake. And the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. And there you have sin enters into the world. And the first thing that happens is sin separates us from God. And then sin separates us from one another. And then that separation goes down through Adam and Eve's children. Adam and Eve had two sons, Cain and Abel. You've heard this story? Cain kills his brother Abel. Now, here's the question. How long did Cain hate his brother? The answer is as long as he was Abel. Those are what's called dad jokes. So this hostility that started with us and God migrated to us and other people. That's where it started. And ever since then, you go through the book of Genesis, you see division, hostility, murder, theft, lying, hatred, slavery. All of this comes from this hostility, first with God, then it leads to each other. And so you say, well, I'm not very hostile inside. Well, let me tell you something. If you are a sinner, you have the same seed. John Owens, the great Puritan, said this. He said, the seed of every sin is in every heart. Now, what is this sin? Sin on its own is, gives us this innate desire to lift ourselves up above other people. Have you ever met somebody who thought they were perfect? Have you ever met somebody who thought that they didn't stink, if you know what I mean? Have you ever thought somebody that, you know, they, they were so great and so wonderful, and didn't they kind of make you sick? Do you realize that within us we have that propensity ourselves to self-justify, to prove that we are better than other people? Even, even though outwardly you may not show it, inwardly you constantly judge people. And you think, you know, I'm better than that person. I'm not a dead Pete like that person. I'm smarter than that person. I've got more sense than that person. I'm better looking than that person. I know a lot of you think that, right? I know I do. 
But what that stems from is this insecurity that we have before God because we are separated from God and we feel this emptiness, we feel this void. We think that if we can somehow feel better about ourselves, if we can somehow look better and think that we're better than other people, we think that we have more value and that God will love us or that people will love us. And what happens is is that we take our identity, whatever it is, and we make it our idol. And we find our value, our significance, our worth, our pride in that identity rather than finding it in God. So what we do is we look for things. We look for things about ourselves, or we look for things about our family, or we look for things about our group that we're in. It could be our race, it could be our nation, our nationality, our family, our sports teams, our color, our history, our gender, our education, our careers, our looks, our generation. We look at whatever it is, and we use those things to lift up ourselves above other people. And it is, listen, it is intoxicating. I think, I think about it in a very funny way. You know, football season's coming up, and last year Kentucky actually had a team. And so we're hoping that we field one this team. But it's very interesting that even for people that are sports fans, we find our identity in our team, and we talk trash to everyone that we beat. We're better than you. Rah, rah, re. And what we do is we look for things, whatever it is, to puff us up. And so if we can puff ourselves up, we can then push other people down, and we feel better about ourselves. So we say, I'm rich, you're poor. I'm smart, you're dumb. I'm white, you're not white. I'm a man, you're a woman. I'm a Kentucky fan, you're a loser. I mean, whatever you have to say, you just say it. And so what happens is this, is that when we idolize our identity, our nationality, our politics, our race, our class, our generation, our gender, when we idolize those things and we think that we're the best, then we demonize anyone who's not like us. There's a lot of things I want to say there, especially when it comes to modern-day politics. And what we do is we say, listen, we are the insiders. Those people are the outsiders. We want the outsiders out and the insiders in. And so, from the beginning of time, And to where we are today, racism, sexism, elitism, ethnocentrism, I know those are big $50 college words, and I went to college, and so i got to use them, get my money's worth. Terrorism, white superiority, black power, genocide, all of those things arise out of a heart that finds its identity and meaning in something other than God. And the issue is not a lack of education. It's not, well, those are just a bunch of rednecks who, who are just Neanderthals. No, it's not a lack of education. It's not the problem. It's not a lack of enlightenment. It's not even a lack of financial resources. I mean, I told you a couple of weeks ago about, about the Nazis and, and, and just the horrific crimes and atrocities that they did in, in murdering over 6 to 7 million people systematically in a 2 or 3 year period. The Nazis, if you know anything about Germany at that time, were some of the most Ill- educated elites of that day. And yet they could follow this. What's the cause of the hostility? The cause of the hostility is sin. And sin builds walls. Think about this interpersonally. Think about your relationship with your spouse. Think about this relationship with other people. What builds walls and barriers between you and other people? If you get to the root of it, it's sin. What could that sin be? It could be pride. It could be greed. It could be lust. It could be something else. It could be your anger problems, whatever it is, because sin builds walls of hostility, first with God and then with other people. Sin separates us from God, separates us from other people. So as as the great African-American professor at the Beeson School for Theology in Birmingham, Alabama, Robert Smith said, he said, the problem is not a skin problem. The problem is a sin problem. And let me just share with you folks that until we see these prejudices as sin, until we see how we look at other people with feelings of superiority or even feelings of inferiority, that is sin. Until we see it for what it is and call it what it is, we're going to continue to justify it and dismiss it. And we see this rhetoric. Do you not? I, I wish. I wish I could say what I really want to say on this topic. Do you not see the rhetoric in our political system today, where you have people that have to have pride in this or nationalism in that, and what they're doing is they're dividing people. And these are the walls of hostility. 
And the answer to that walls of hostility is not going to be a political solution. There is, I don't care who you elect to be president, they are not going to fix this problem. They cannot fix this problem. But here's the good news, the problem's been fixed. And that's the second point because I don't, I don't have all day to preach and you don't have all day to listen. And that is the work of Christ. Verse 13, let me get to the Bible instead of, instead of politics. Ephesians, so this is who, he says, remember who you once were. You were once this in the flesh. You were once this when it comes to God. But now, thank God for the buts in the Bible. Amen? Ain't nothing wrong with what I said there. Thank God for the buts. But now, this is, if you remember in verse 11, he said, this is at one time you were this. This is who you were. But, let's say this together, now. If you are in Christ, this is who you are. But now, in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That that is that your old identities, those things that used to identify you, that you used to find your significance, your value, your worth in, those things are gone. Christ has brought in something new. See, Christ tore down the walls of hostility. And he did so by giving us a new way of understanding what it means to be inside and what it means to be outside. See, Christ came in and he dealt with the, the problem that no other person can deal with. He dealt with the sin problem. And my sin problem is bigger than my race problem, my religion problem, my education problems, and my wealth problems or my polit- political problems. And the only solution to this problem is that Jesus had to die on the cross in my place to take my sin. The only thing that was going to fix me with God is that Jesus had to become my sin. And so that I took his righteousness and he took my sin. See, with God, there are, there's no such thing as inside and outside. Everybody in the world wasn't on the inside. Everybody in the world is on the outside. Sin's curse on all of us means this. There are no good people. There are no winners. There are no people who have it all together. All of us are cursed from our birth, depraved to the grave, and destined to spend eternity in hell. All of us. Regardless of your ethnicity, regardless of your politics, regardless of your economic status, all of us. But then Jesus showed up. And in verses 13 through 18, the Bible tells us that Christ shows up. He dies on the cross to bring us near. We were far from God. He brings us near to God. We were outsiders. Jesus comes and makes us insiders. He is our peace. He made us one. He broke down the wall. He reconciles us to God. He killed the hostility. He made us right with God. Then, because he made us right with God, he can make us right with other people. Think about this thought. Apart from Christ... You and I are further from God than we could ever imagine. But in Christ, you are nearer to God than you can ever dream. See, you and I have a new identity. If you read through verses 14 through 22, we see that we went from being an old man to a new man. From having access denied to access granted by the Spirit. From being illegal aliens to fellow citizens. From being homeless to the household of God all made possible by the blood of Jesus. So in verse 15, the Bible says that he might create, he did all of this, that he might create in himself one new man in place of two, so making peace. The word new here is not just a restoration of something that's old and making it new. It is to be completely new. And what Jesus did is when he died on the cross, he divided and tore down, uh, I mean, he conquered and tore down all the walls that divided us, these walls of hostilities, these old identity markers, and he created for himself a new man, a new person that comes from every tribe, every tongue, and every nation, and that new person is the church of Jesus Christ. So listen, if you are in Christ, your primary identity is not an American is not white, is not black, is not brown. It's not Floridian, it's not Kentuckian, but it is a new race of humanity. All those other distinctions, which are not bad distinctions, are secondary to that primary identity. See, it's not that those distinctions don't matter. It's that they don't ultimately matter. 
let this get in your mind. Our cultural differences may distinguish us, but they don't define us. And when you and I understand that my identity is not that I'm a white man, not that I'm from Kentucky, not that I'm a man. It's that my primary identity is that I am in Christ. Then the hostilities go away. Because I realize that in Christ, there is nothing about me that makes me better than anyone else. Because I was dead. I was dying. I had no hope. I was helpless. I was hopeless. But Jesus Christ came, took my place, died on the cross, rose from the dead, gives me salvation, and I'm a new person. And so when I look at other people, I don't have to look at them and think I'm better than them because I know I'm not. And I don't have to look at someone else and say I'm worse than them because I know Jesus died to make me worthy. See, in Christ, the things that used to define us don't define us anymore. We have more in common in Christ than we did anywhere else. Do you realize that you have more in common with a Mexican man who comes across this border illegally but knows Jesus Christ as his Savior than you do with your neighbor next door that's an American. Now you say, well, that's political. I'm not trying to get into politics. Let the, let the dead bury the dead, but I'm going to rise and follow Jesus. Now some of you are like, well, Pastor, what about my past? Pastor, that's nice for you to say you're a part, you're, you're a white man. You've not gone through what I've gone through. And you're right, I haven't. But what I I want to say about the past is something you need to understand about the past. When Jesus Christ came, He didn't just bring peace. He came to be peace. And because Jesus came and He died on the cross and rose from the dead, when when God the Father looks at us, He does not look at us based on our past. He looks on us based on our perfect Savior. Does that mean that it erases the past? I don't know. Ask God. See, how God treats us in Christ should fundamentally and forever affect how we treat each other. I'm, I'm not ignorant. Somebody told me the other day that racism is dead in America. Are you living under a rock? All of us in this room, regardless of your skin tone or ethnicity or pigmentation, have the tendencies of racism. The penalty, however, for racism and inequality and and injustice has been paid for by Jesus Christ. But yet the presence of those sins still remain even in the church. But if you want to get free from that, see what Christ has done. Find your identity in Him. And then you can fight against the sins you see in yourself and you can be reconciled with other people. Folks, this isn't just about ethnicity. This is is applicable to any kind of interpersonal relationship you have. That your identity in Christ is greater than any identity you find here on earth because everything else is artificial. That's the only identity that's eternal. So let me get to the last point because it's about all we can take. And that's this, the way forward. What's the way forward for our church? I don't have time to completely go through this text line upon line. I wish I did. But in verses 19 through 22, Paul tells us that because of Christ, all believers essentially have three things in common. And so if you're a Christian in this room, or you meet a Christian, you have three things in common. Number one, you have a common Savior, Jesus Christ. Number two, you have a common foundation, a foundation built On the apostles and the prophets, you have the Word of God. Number three, if you are a Christian, you have a common purpose. And that is that you are spirit-empowered to declare the gospel to the nations and make disciples of all people. So, regardless of who you are, regardless of where you're from, how much money you have, who you know, everyone in this room, if you are in Christ, you have a common Savior, Jesus, a common truth, the Bible, and a common purpose to make disciples of all people. That is what should unite us. See, the unity that was destroyed by sin is restored in Jesus and is to be proclaimed by the church. You know what this world is longing for? This, the, 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 the hope of unity. 
the hope of justice, the hope of equality, what the world is hoping to achieve through political, educational means can only be achieved through Jesus. And so, when there's a church, when there's a group of people that is multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-socioeconomic, when those people who have been historically divided for centuries, when those people come together and worship together and fellowship together and love one another, it is what the world is longing to see. And so that's why God has called the church to declare the manifold wisdom of God. That the church makes the gospel visible to the world. And so a part of our vision as a church is to be multi-ethnic. And so with that being said, our goal is not merely to be multi-ethnic, to be cool. It's amazing how many churches do things to be cool. Let me just tell you something. In our post-Christian, post-modern society, the church will never be cool. And if it ever is cool, it's more like the culture than it is like Christ. All right, now I'm done preaching. Now, our goal is not merely to be multi-ethnic, to be cool, but to be an authentic gospel community made up of diverse believers in Christ from our community, from every ethnicity. So what does it look like? Well, I'm glad you asked. I want to give you three analogies. This is not original. I found this in J.D. Greer's book, Gaining by Losing. And he says there's three analogies when it comes to thinking multi-ethnicity. One is you can think of being a multi-ethnic church being like a bag of marbles. Have you ever had a bag of marbles? Maybe some of you have lost yours. But if you think of a bag of marbles, you have a, you have a bag of marbles that have different colored marbles in there. And they're next to each other, but they don't really, don't really change one another. And so a lot of people think that a multi-ethnic church is kind of like a bag of marbles, that you have people from different ethnicities in close proximity. They all go to the same church, but no one is changed by them in the process. So they don't change one another. This one's red, this one's black, this one's brown, this one's purple, whatever, but they don't really interact with each other. That's one analogy for multi-ethnic church. Another analogy for multi-ethnic church is a melting pot. Now, I'm not talking about that expensive place you go eat at. But think about you just put all these ingredients together, and basically some people think if you just put black people and white people and brown people and all kinds of different people, that some that speak Spanish, some that speak English, some that speak Creole, and all these things together, and you just kind of mix the pot up, that whatever comes out is what, is what the church should be. It's kind of all melted together. And what happens, though, if that's your concept, is whatever the dominant culture is, is what it's going to, going to taste like. Like you can have a big old thing of tomato sauce and put a dollop of mustard in and it's still going to taste like what? Tomato sauce. So that's not what we're looking for. I like his analogy because it's close to dinner or lunch and it's beef stew. Anybody like beef stew? I love beef stew. So you have in a beef stew, you have beef, that's what's for dinner. You have carrots, onions, broth. And each of these components in the beef stew are distinct. And you add them together, you put them together, you cook them together. And what happens is, is that those elements, those carrots and those onions and that beef, begins to season the other elements. So that the carrots still taste like carrots, but they got a little bit of beef in them. And they got a little bit of onion in them. And they got a little bit of broth in them. And then you have that beef, and it's got a little bit of carrot in it, a little bit of onion in it, a little bit of broth in it. And it just, when you add those together, though they still have their distinctive qualities, but when they're all together, it tastes so good. Amen? That's the way the church should be. You don't lose your distinctiveness. You just season one another. See, we're not to be colorblind. Somebody said the other day, Pastor, I don't see color. Well, you ain't looking. God made color, amen? I'm glad He made color. Now, some of you that are colorblind or some of you that are blind, you can't see it, but God created different colors. God's not colorblind. When we're in heaven, it's not going to just gonna be one color. It's going to be multicolored. See, God is not colorblind, and neither should we be. We should be color engaging. Jerome Gay, Jerome Gay said this, he says, I don't need to be blind to those around me that are different, 
And I don't need to act like I don't at times make assumptions about them. The key is not to be led by those assumptions and prejudices and allow God to use a diverse community to shape us more into His image. That's the way forward for the church. So how can we do that? And with a few moments, I want to tell you real quickly how we can do that. One is through humility. I think, go back one second. I think that the biggest problem in all churches is that we're a bunch of proud people. Think about this statement. If everyone in the church was to do this next statement from the Bible, how it would change everything. Read, let's read the words of Paul. Paul says to the church of Philippi, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. you imagine what that would happen if we did that? He said, Let each, of, each one of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Verse 4, hopefully. Verse 4 says, actually, that did, that did do verse 4. That's all there. And the people up there are like, you're an idiot down here. <laughs> but they're not supposed to say that because they're pre to prefer me and think that I'm more significant than they are. But listen, if, if we as a church would just sacrifice our preferences and our styles and our wants for others, what would happen? We do it through humility. We consider others more significant than ourselves. A part of that is giving other people the benefit of the doubt. You know what I found? That if you assume people are against you, you will find evidence of it everywhere. And you do it through intentionality. As a church, nothing meaningful happens by accident. If we're to be a multi-ethnic church that really is a reflection of our community, we have to take intentional steps to ensure that people of all ethnicities and generational backgrounds feel welcome through our leadership, through our platform, through our friendliness, through our musical styles, through what we celebrate and our love for each other. We have to intentionally engage people that are not like us. Albert Tate, in his letters to a Birmingham jail, said the question isn't guess who's coming to church, but rather guess who's coming to dinner. We have to think beyond just gathering. Just Don't just check off your box. Well, this week I was multi-ethnic. I went and sat in a room with people that weren't like me. You can check that off at Walmart. It's not guess who I went to church with. It's guess who I ate dinner with. Guess who I hang out with? Guess who are in my life? If we want to see the change that this world is longing to see, it has to start with us. So the question I have is this. Do you have friends who are not like you? Are you seeking to embrace and learn from people that are not like you? Do you have a relationship in your life that would make the watching world wonder, why are those people friends? They have nothing in common. And if you don't, why not? I mean, it's not enough for us to have a church of great diversity, but we never spend time with each other. If all the white people just huddle up with white people, and all the African Americans just huddle up with people that are African American, and all the Hispanics with the Hispanics, if all the old with the old and the young with the young, that's not the church. That's a social club. That's a clique. The church of Jesus Christ is people from every nation, every tribe, every background coming together. Why? Because there's only one race, and that's a human race. There's only one problem, and that's a sin problem. And there's only one solution, the blood of Jesus. And that's why the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The gospel of Jesus Christ takes those who are natural enemies and brings them together. I'll end with this. A few weeks ago, I went to the Middle East and while I was in the Middle East, a lot of people that I told where I went said, you shouldn't go there. You shouldn't go there. Don't go there. You'll die. You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you I spent an entire week where I was, and I never once felt scared for my life. And while I was there, I met a guy named Y. Y uh, is an Iraqi Arab. And he moved to Turkey because of ISIS, and his house, his whole village was destroyed by ISIS. And so he had to flee to Turkey, and then eventually in time he was able to come back to where I was. And he grew up a, a Sunni devout, Sunni Muslim, but 
Uh, because of the war and because of what he saw, he began to be disenchanted with Islam. So I met him at his house uh, because of the guys that I was with in this country. And one of the guys that I was with bought a car from him and established a relationship with him. And he invited us into his home. Now, hospitality in this part of the world is huge. So I enter into his house. And the first thing that they do, any, anywhere you go to the house, I mean, they can be just so poor, have nothing, and they'll offer you everything they have. I would go to tent to tent to tent, people living in abject, worse, horrible poverty, and all of them would give me a glass of tea, hot tea. They call it chai. If you're not familiar with chai tea in that part of the world, half of it is sugar, half of it is tea. You stir it together, and it's your, your, your spoon gets stuck. And I would drink it, and i say, God, I'll put it down if you keep it down. So there we were in Wise House, sitting in his front room, and we began to talk with him and begin to hear his story, but hear, hear his background. And eventually we shared the gospel with Y. And we shared the gospel with our teacups right here. And we shared the three circles, and, and it's amazing how it turned into three circles. And here, this guy that was here, um, who had bought the car from Y, uh, shared the, the gospel, said that this is God's design, and God had a perfect design, and yet sin came in and destroyed that design, and, and now leads to brokenness. But if, because Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead, if you repent of your sins and believe, then you can have the ability to recover and pursue God's design for your life. You could have a new life. And we shared Jesus with this man, and I didn't know what to expect. Now, it was all in Arabic, and I was getting some translation, and there was this, that, and going on. The next thing I know, this guy stands up. And he says, I believe. His son's sitting right there next to him, listening to the whole thing. We share the gospel again to make sure. He says, I believe. I believe. When it was over, I wanted to know, why is it that you believe? Because I've heard stories while I was there in the country that a lot of people that were, they were Muslim were getting dreams, and God was sharing with them that I am the truth, and then someone would come and share the gospel with him. So I was expecting to hear him tell me about some dream. You know what he said was what caused him to believe? Here's what he said. He says, it was the love of Jesus that I saw in Christians. He said that when I went to Turkey, when I fled for my life in Turkey, I met some people that were Christians. And the only people who would help me were Christians. He said, they were the nicest people I've ever met. And then he moved back into a neighborhood. And he didn't know it, but the neighborhood was a Christian neighborhood. And he said, all these people would come to my house, check on me. He says, never in my life have I ever met people who were more caring and more loving as Christians. And then he said, I met this guy who bought a car from me. And I've never in my life met someone as honest, as caring, and as loving as you. He said, I told my wife, I want whatever they have. And he says, that's why I believe. And so we shared with him, and again, to make sure he understood, and he understood. And here's the thing about this culture. These people are not like a lot of Americans who say they make a decision, and there ain't no decision. These people, when they give their life to Christ and they say they believe, they really believe because if they truly believe, they could die for what they believe. And so we, we shared to why. We said, why? We take these three circles. You take these three circles and you share this with your wife tonight. And the reason we do that is we want to see if this guy is legitimate or not. And we got, a, we got a message that evening that Y shared the gospel with his wife. And that evening, she became a follower of Jesus Christ. Whenever I go to different countries and I see God moving, this, this story is not meant to pat me on the back. Listen, I was just a flea on the back of an elephant in that thing. I didn't do anything. I didn't move anything. I just was watching. I didn't have to understand what they were saying. But I saw God moving. And every time I see somebody, whether it's in India or where I was in the Middle East or in Central America or other places in the world, I see these people that I just envision the day in heaven I'm going to be with them. 
you know, one day in heaven, I'm going to see why, and I'm going to see his family. And all these artificial things, like I'm an American, he's an Iraqi. All those things aren't going to matter. I speak English, he speaks Arabic. It's not going to matter. All these things, these artificial identities that we had on this earth are not going to mount to a hill of beans in heaven. Because the only thing that we're going to care about in heaven is worshiping Jesus together. And I just envision in my mind that one day I'm going to be there with Y and his wife and hopefully his little boys. And I'm there one day with them and you're there with me and we are looking to Jesus and we're saying, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 7, it says, In this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, saying, crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The reason that we want to pursue multi-ethnic community at Central is because that's what heaven's going to be like. Thanks again for listening to this past week's message, and we pray that God blesses His Word in your life. If you'd like to have more information about Central, you can go to centralsanford.net. And we pray that you have a great week of worship, and we hope to see you next time. Have a great day. God bless.